Uh, my name is John Brandt. I'm the chief of police for Brownsville Borough. I've been here going 17 years. Started out as a patrolman, went through the ranks, sergeant lieutenant, became chief about a year and a half ago when Stanley Jablonski retired. Um, I used to work mostly nights, now I'm on daylights primarily. Um, All right. Now, I'm Mike Obel. I'm the Fayette County District Attorney. Um, so my job is uh, I'm the Chief Law Enforcement Officer in Fayette County. So the prosecution of every criminal case that is filed in our county goes through my office from the preliminary hearing stage all the way through trial, through appeals, um, all stages. Um, unless there's a conflict of interest or some other reason why my office couldn't handle it. Um, so I work closely, of course, with law enforcement. We do not, uh, we're not obligated, law enforcement in our county is not obligated to have the district attorney approve uh, child abuse cases or abuse cases of any kind. However, most of these types of cases do go through uh, some type of review with our office prior to that being filed. Um, CYS cases, anything that has a CYS element to it and a law enforcement element, uh, we usually work with CYS um, at every stage. There's from forensic interviews to uh, search warrants, whatever it may be. These uh, the civil side and the criminal side seem to intersect. So um, that's a that's a very important part of what I do as district attorney. And uh, we work with uh, Crime Victim Center to keep our victims informed of every stage of the proceeding. Um, Crime Victim Center has uh, has personnel that sit with our uh, victims and witnesses during each stage of the proceedings, whether it be preliminary hearings, suppression hearings, trial. Um, and, um, and that's that's it. Our, my job, again, is to uh, put together all the evidence and um, statements that the, that the police have, have obtained and get the justice in court that our uh, that our victims deserve. Hi, my name is Dee Dee Blosnich. I'm the director of programming for A Child's Place PA. We are the Child Advocacy Center that serves Fayette County. Um, we actually serve six counties in southwestern Pennsylvania, Fayette, Allegheny, Beaver, Westmoreland, Washington, and Green. Um, as Mike said, our job here as the Child Advocacy Center, we work with law enforcement, CYS, Crime Victim Center, the DA's office. We are the entity that provides the forensic interviews for child abuse cases. Um, a Child Advocacy Center is that neutral, kid-friendly space where kids can come and be interviewed by a trained forensic interviewer. Um, they follow a specific protocol that will hold up in court. We record all of our interviews and those interviews are then turned over to the district attorney or law enforcement to be used in court for criminal proce proceedings. Um, law enforcement and caseworkers can observe all of our interviews through a two-way mirror when the interviewer is interviewing the child. Um, our interviewers meet with the parents um, to get some background information, then they interview the child separately from the parent. And like I said, we record that. And then those recordings are turned over to law enforcement um, after that. And we have family advocates that help to provide some information referral for all of the families that come into our child advocacy centers. Um, we help them with, you know, get hooked up with any kind of community services that they might need. Um, in Fayette County, we also provide a parenting support program, um, which is an evidence-based program to help with child abuse prevention, as well as a, the Parents as Teachers program, which is also um, an evidence-based program. And we do that because, you know, we work at it from both ends. We do the forensic interviews when there are those allegations of abuse, but we also want to work with parents to help prevent child abuse from happening again, or at all. Um, so that's why we provide a lot of those support services um, as well. 
Hi, everybody. My name is Kareen, or Corey, as most people do call me. Uh, Barry, I am the executive director of CASA Fayette County. CASA stands for Court Appointed Special Advocates. So what we do as an organization is we recruit and train volunteers who advocate for the children who suffered abuse and neglect here in Fayette County. Our volunteers work directly with the children to advocate for their best interests. But not only do they work with the children, they work with the biological family. They work with resource families. We work in schools. And we also will work um, anything that involves a child. So mental health services, we work with everybody who has contact with that child. And we operate under a court order and we operate specifically in dependency court. Um, right now we are servicing 29 children, which is absolutely fantastic. Our numbers have grown over the past year. Um, <clears throat> Our advocates are trained for about 30 hours prior to taking their own case, and they spend an average of 5 to 15 hours per month with their children that they're assigned. Our advocates are assigned to one case where it, a CYS caseworker can have up to 30 cases, so our advocates are able to provide more time um, in the house to really get to know the kids we're working with. Hello, my name is Andrea Hibbs. I'm the executive director at the Crime Victims Center here in Fayette County. And we have been in business uh, on gone 49 years now. So uh, we started out as a women's resource center and we grew from there. So we are a comprehensive agency and we're also a nonprofit organization. So we provide free and confidential services to victims of all sexual assault and other violent crimes. Um, our, we have a staff of 11. And really what we do, we, we work with all these wonderful people up here on the, on the panel today, um, starting with uh, preliminary hearings at the magistrate's office and going all the way through the court system. And that is with the adult and the juvenile court system. So we have legal advocates in both of those entities. Um, we have three counselors. So if any of those individuals that are going through that process needs any type of counseling um, services, we offer that as well. Um, we have an outreach and prevention department, so we are able to come out to community events like this, um, have information tables out into the community to talk about our services and what's available to individuals. And then we are also in the school districts here in Fayette County. So our prevention programs start at pre-K and go all the way to post-secondary schools. And we have a wide range of topics that we are able to discuss in the schools with your children. A lot of um, maybe your, your children or people that you know, family or friends or you yourselves maybe have had um, programs in the schools and that was a lot of those came from our organization. Um, we also do have a contract with um, Children and Youth Services to provide a, a, a a evidence-based program um, like CAC does for parenting, but ours are court-ordered uh, parents that have to go through a parenting class because they have offended their children. So we are we um, provide an 11-week course for those individuals to go through a parenting class. This will help them determine uh, whether they end up getting their children back or if it's there's you know they need to go into the next step and do terminations with those individuals. Um, so our organization, um, I wanted to throw out some numbers there just because we're, we're a lot of our funding that we receive is based on our fund on numbers that we do. So I pulled some reports. And so like for all of calendar year last year for 2023, we uh, provided services to 773 victims in Fayette County. That was in the adult system and 793 victims in the juvenile system. To me, I think that's just too high. We, you know, we shouldn't be having those types of numbers. We shouldn't, I mean, it's wonderful that we are being able to provide that service to those victims, but we shouldn't be having victims that we have to have services for. And we had seen since July of last year to current, a 135% increase in those numbers. And again, that, that's, that's just, that's sad. We, we shouldn't be doing that, that, that shouldn't be happening. And um, so, what I think all of us up here on the panel really wants to put out there is that we really want to be able to educate the community on, you know, what happens if you suspect something? What happens if you see something? Who do you report to? How do you report it? And I apologize, Children and Youth Services was supposed to be here today, and they do talk a lot about reporting and they, there was an emergency that they had to attend to, so they weren't able to attend tonight. Um, 
but you know, children and youth services sometimes gets a very bad rap because people think all they want to do is take their children away from from homes, and that's not always the case. You know, there's always investigations that go on. You know, there's always law enforcement. You know, the district attorney's office is involved in cases. So it, it's a whole group of people that work together to make these determinations and these decisions in cases. So, um, you know, we always ask, you know, if you have questions, please reach out. Please ask those questions because the more you're educated, the better it is for everyone and the, and the better decisions can be made. So, thank you. We, yeah. Are we good? Yeah. Okay. I would say we are. Does anybody have any questions? What do you do if you do suspect abuse? Like, I think my neighbor is hurting their kid. In Pennsylvania, there is the child line number. It's a toll-free number. Um, and anybody who suspect, 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 ugh, I can't <laughs> suspects child abuse um, or that a child is being harmed, you don't have to have any proof that it's happening you don't have to see it for yourself you just have to suspect and you can call that 1-800 number 1-800-932-0313 I, I think I think that's correct <laughs> <laughs> or you could um, just google childline exactly yeah <laughs> and you, you could also make a report to childline um, on the internet through their portal mm -hmm. um, the the Department of Human Services in Pennsylvania does have a portal um, where you could also make an electronic report. You would just fill out the, the form online and you can submit it that way. And all of those reports that come into Childline then are funneled either to law enforcement or to CYS or both. And just to give some clarity, when you call to Childline, if you are not a mandated reporter, you do not have to provide your name. You are able to do that 100% anonymously. I know a lot of people do not report because they're afraid that this, they're going to be found out. It's better to report than not to report whenever you suspect. Yes. And that big word I think is suspect. It's not like you had to actually see something or hear something, but if you just have that gut feeling that you think something's just not right, report it you know, report it. What happens after the report's made? So first of all, those reports go, they go to CYS. I get them personally at my email. My chief county detective gets them. Every child line report comes to our office and CYS's office. Depending on the nature of the report, uh, CYS will determine, um, uh, at least when I was with CYS, um, <laughs> would determine what type of reporting was necessary. Some reports are within 24 hours, you know, fairly immediate. I'm sure whatever report was received by CYS today is something that they had to go out on right now. There's some reports that could be a 72 hour um, investigation window, depending on what it is. If it's, if it's something of a sexual nature, or if it's a serious allegation of abuse, it's gonna be pretty immediate. And it's going to be, regardless if it's after business hours, somebody's going to go out that night. Law enforcement's going to be involved. Um, if it's if it's a uh, if it's a collect case or if it's some other general protective services thing, it may be seventy-two hour response. Ultimately, CYS will determine whether or not there's any indicators of abuse or neglect. Um, services will be provided. Um, Waivers will be requested for anything for medical records, school records, counseling records. And based on the information that's provided, um, it could be a case where there's, un where there's unfounded uh, report filed, or it could go as high as law enforcement becomes involved and then there's two parallel investigations going forward where there's an indicated, uh, indicated case of child abuse as well as a law enforcement investigation that results in criminal charges. Is each case um, investigated? Yes. Every single one of them, no matter what the report is? Every case that goes through child lines is supposed to be investigated. Some okay. contact is supposed to be made. Okay. Yes. There's no reason why it wouldn't be investigated. And I believe, I think the the new rule is that they have to ha they have to have some type of contact within 48 hours and i could be mistaken i don't want to miss misspeak but i think there was some change where it they had so many hours that they have to respond now as well y yes no 
Um, so if the, a report is classified as a CPS, which is your child, child Protective Service, all of your Child Protective Services are investigated. And those have a time frame of 24 hours. So you have up to 24 hours to make contact with that identified child. Um, General Protective Services, there are times where they'll make a couple phone calls and a caseworker won't go out. But that's like somebody calls in and says, my neighbor's feeding their kid only mac and cheese. Does that child have it? Like the CYS can call and say, does that child have any eating like barriers that they're only eating mac and cheese? So there are some times that they don't go to the home, um, but they do make follow ups, if that makes sense. So in Harrisburg, I'm on the Children and Youth Committee, and one of the things that we voted out of the committee this week was a bill that would require a statewide reporting system, um, and it was based on, forgive me, I can't believe I, I don't remember the, the child's name, I think she was about 14 and she was brutally murdered a few years ago, dismembered by her um, adoptive mom who was actually employed through CYS and her and her paramount, her paramour, and um, the my understanding is that there was a need for the statewide reporting because there was the each county does their own record keeping and this mom knew she was like one step ahead of the reporting she she would know that something was up and that they would move to the to the next county can you tell me any hurdles or hardships that, that you all experience and, and have you seen this in action that you know there's something going on in big county and then they vanished to different county and what roadblocks does that create for you in terms of making sure that I don't want to speak for CYS, but I mean, I, I was a caseworker in 2010. That was an issue then. Um, the only time that you're, that you're really going to know in that job that there's a history in another county um, is if somebody is courteous enough to give you a phone call. And that did happen occasionally. You know, Somerset CYS calls and says, hey, we have this family. They, we think we, they moved over the border to avoid us. And then, you know, you might get some information. Um, it is a problem, though. A statewide reporting system would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm surprised that it's something that hasn't happened yet. But it was a unanimous vote on the committee. I'm assuming it will be on the House floor, too. Yeah. And, and we see some of the challenges in these particular situations when we're working with those children, either providing counseling or actually going through the court process and we don't see them anymore. We don't hear from them. And then we're trying to figure out what happened to them. We don't have, you know, con a lot of times we see people change our phone numbers very often. So not only are they moving, but then are also changing any kind of contact information in order to try to do any kind of follow-ups with them. Um, so we, we see that um, working with the clients ourselves on that end of it. When, when, the, when the family or the child disappears like that, is there um, typically a, a call to the police, you know, in terms of, hey, you know, this it may or may not be a missing person situation, or is it just, oh, I can't get in touch with them, and then for jurisdictional reasons, mm -hmm. you're to find? I think it honestly depends on the case. Mm -hmm. I know um, I was previously at a CYS agency, not in Fayette County, um, and if a family would move and we would not have... Um, notice of them moving, we would do a search through the um, welfare department to see if they had changed their benefit address. So we can make that referral to the neighboring county or the county across state. Um, so we were able to try to locate them that way. Um, and we could hire an investigator. Um, the CYS has access to investigators who are able to kind of really narrow down where that family went. I think the biggest issue is going to come to when it's general protective services. Mm -hmm. If we have allegations of a criminal act, um, it makes it a little different. If somebody tries to leave the jurisdiction, there's a criminal act. We have an active investigation. If it's state police territory, they can contact somebody else, state police. Even if it's um, local police, you know, local police can get in contact with somebody else, bring them back. The crime's already occurred here. We can always prosecute that here. When you're talking about um, food, shelter, clothing, um, truancy, you know, the issue, if it leaves the county, it unfortunately comes to a situation where it's 
technically been cured in our county, it becomes somebody else's issue. But again, if we've had those issues and we we have a statewide reporting system where we can say these people have been accused of not providing adequate food, clothing, shelter for this child, regardless if they move, they're already on somebody's radar. And it doesn't have to come to a point where somebody has to notice that this is going on before they get the services that are necessary for the children. Is that something that they are considering just statewide or are they that it could expand nationally? And, and that, that was my thought too, but as a state lawmaker, I have no authority, but it would be something that would be a bit worth lobbying because I think so, particularly where we're at, where I live five minutes from the West Virginia line, mm -hmm. you know, it would be ultra easy to move across the state line. So mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think that that is definitely something worth it for. Yes. And I was going to say that is something that's very common, um, again, in my former role that I am no longer in, I would have people move to West Virginia all the time because yeah. mm -hmm. it's right there. Um, and then you have no say over there. You don't have that inner agency cooperation. Other than seeing a child being physically beaten or something, what are some signs that something is wrong that people could look for or notice or validate a gut feeling they have that something is wrong? Do you think you say that? <laughs> sure. Um, well, I think some of the signs that you can look for, for, you know, just kids in your community, you know, are they missing a lot of school? Um, do you not see them outside a lot? Um, when they do go to school, are teachers, you know, seeing behavior problems? Um, you know, some of the common ones, if it's summer, are they wearing long sleeves, long pants, you know, and, and trying to hide, you know, physical injuries? Um, are kids withdrawn when they're in school? Do they not want to talk? Do they not have friends? Things, you know, things like that. Some of those are, you know, pretty common sense because, you know, kids are pretty resilient and, you know, when they're with their friends or in school and outside playing, um, we don't really think that anything is wrong. But when you start to see those kind of red flags that you don't see the kids, you know, or, they're asking neighbors for food or, you know, money, things like that. Um, those would be some of the, the red flags that I would say that as community members, um, y'all could look for, for about the kids in your neighborhoods. When you, when you talk about truancy, how many days um, missed of school do they step in? For CYS or? Anybody to help the child that doesn't go to school? Or refuses well, to go to school? I think that depends on the school district. school district. Every school district has their own policy regarding what constitutes truancy, right? Um, and that could be a little bit tricky um, before school districts will report kids actually truant. Um, but, you know, when you see those long absences, those big lapses of, of kids not being in school, um, then that certainly is a red flag um, for those school personnel to report something. And again, like we said, all you have to do is suspect. You don't, you do not have to have any proof. You don't have to have evidence. You don't have to provide that when you make that phone call to Childline or fill out that report online. What happens if someone makes a report and it's unfounded? Or will they get in trouble? No, if they, were, if they make a report and CYS does the investigation and it's considered unfounded, um, the person who made the report, once you make the report, there's nothing else that, you know, a reporter has to worry about. Um, so I can't quote the statute for you, but the in order to be uh, charged or convicted for false reports to CYS, it has to be for it has to be for a specific purpose. If you're making the report and you turn out to be wrong, that's not right. a chargeable offense. Now, if you are, if we can prove that you've reported your uh, the the mother of your children because you want to gain an advantage in a custody trial, then you could be charged. Um, but uh, aside from that, you're you're insulated from liability if you report child abuse if you do it for you know a good faith purpose. Does the reporter get any type of notification that 
the your, their report was investigated or was followed up on at all? Like, yes. Do, do we have a right to know that? If you are a mandated reporter, yes. Okay. You, you will. That and they yes. Don't send any information to us. You only get specific information as a mandated reporter. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, mandated reporters um, under the Child Protective Services Law are to be given specific information once the case is closed and the investigation is finished with CYS, and that's whether the report was um, indicated, unfounded, and if there were any services, any further services being provided to the family. Dee, Dee, did you would you you talked about the forensic interview, mm -hmm. but um, maybe people don't know that the, there's two parts to that forensic inter interview with the, the interview and then the medical part. Yep, yep, Do you want to sure. explain that? So yeah, maybe. Sure. Um, so for child protective services cases, um, we are oftentimes you know we schedule kids to come in for forensic interviews, and as I said, we record those interviews, um, we provide them to the district attorney's office. Children use services so they can use them as evidence in any proceedings. Um, but as Andrea said, the second part of our forensic process after the interview is that we recommend a forensic medical exam for every kid that we see. Um, and that forensic medical exam is done by a child abuse a pediatrician or one of our child abuse nurse practitioners. Um, and the purpose and the reason why we recommend a medical exam for every kid that we see, regardless if, if the allegations happened two years ago or three months ago or yesterday, we always recommend that because sometimes kids don't talk right away whenever they come in for an interview. Sometimes they do not make a disclosure of abuse, but that does not mean that it didn't happen. And that doesn't mean that, you know, that kid might say something later on down the road. Um, and this way, the child has an opportunity to be with a child abuse pediatrician who is an expert in that, you know, a, a pediatric doctor who can do an exam and tell them that they are normal, they are healthy, everything looks fine, and it gives those kids peace of mind. Because if something did happen and they didn't talk about it, then they at least are getting that peace of mind from a doctor to say, you look healthy, everything is fine. Nobody, you know, you don't have to worry that anybody would ever think that anything happened to you. Is there a specific facility that you take children to for that? We do those in at the Child Advocacy Center. Okay. Mm -hmm. And like with Dee Dee, when they do, they do the forensic exams on children, um, Uniontown Hospital, which is now West Virginia University Health Systems, and um, Penn Highlands in Connellsville, when they have an individual, an adult, that comes in and um, discloses that they were sexually assaulted, then they will contact our office, and we have advocates that will go to the hospital and accompany them during the forensic rape exam. Because um, a lot of times those individuals, and, and just like in, in with DD with the children, they don't have anybody. So they either need family or a friend or an advocate to be with them to sort of be there just to support them, um, explain the process to them because we know um, terminology, we know what happens, but a lot of times when you're a victim, you don't understand all the legalese and all the medical terminology. So it's important to have advocates there in order to explain the process and be there for them and let them know what their rights are and help them navigate through that system. And um, that's something that I've been an advocate for 30 years in this system. And going to the hospital is one of the most challenging things because you want to help them in, in such a way that you can't take that away from, you can't take that pain or that burden or that trauma away from them. But you want to try to be there to comfort them as much as possible. So we don't work with the children because um, they're the specialty in it and they they um, have their process. But, um, you know, working with the adult victims um, is just as hard. And I think that's just something mm -hmm. that it's, it's, you don't want to have to deal with that. You don't You don't want to have to see anybody have to go through that process. And then what happens after the fact? And then they have to, you know, if, if charges are filed, then they go through the whole process of the, of the criminal system and um, having to go through that process. So they're constantly re-traumatized over and over again. 
And again, that's why we, we all try to work together collectively to make sure that process goes as smoothly as possible um, without traumatizing them. Anybody have any questions right now? Maybe we'll start with Chief Britt, go down the line and sure. talk about how the community can help you do your job or what you want the community <clears throat> to know or do. Well, two ways that primarily the police get notified about child abuse is uh, child line or call from CYS, which we go and investigate with them. And as the district attorney said, sometimes there's a dual investigation. Sometimes it's the police go there after hours and assist for safety. And there's really not a crime being committed. It's just that CYS needs to be involved with this family. The other way is officer initiated. And some of the things that have happened uh, that I've, I've experienced is you get called for vehicle and intersection, guy slumped over a wheel. You go there, you see the guy slumped over the wheel, you look in the back seat, and there's a car seat, and there's a small child in it. So at that point, you know, parent would be taken into custody, COS would be notified, and you'd either take that child in protective custody or, you know, CYS would be involved in, in um, getting that child into another parent or a relative that would take custody of them immediately. Um, and then sometimes it's just, uh, we've had calls in the past where like township supervisors, road crew members, people working in the community have seen things at houses because they're working in that area and they're there for a day, a couple days. And they would notify us like, hey, something just doesn't seem right at this house. So we would go and do basically like a knock and talk um, just go there, make contact with the people, maybe explain to them why we're there, and then see if we can look around from that point, see if CYS needs to be involved or not. The biggest thing for us is for members of the community to, to be alert to the signs and look out for, you know, the things that are indicated, the, uh, the indicators of child abuse. Um, we, uh, you know, we had a big incident down here earlier this year and it's amazing when you hear about when you hear from people in that community and they'll tell you you know oh, we've been seeing for months we've seen this sign we've seen that sign we've seen this problem and it's nobody said anything um so you have if you see it you know try to try to understand it and if you see it report it and hopefully, you know, I mean, if you, if you don't get the answer, if, if nobody comes out or you think it's not being investigated, call again. Um, call the police directly. It doesn't have to be child line. Mm -hmm. Go confront the parents yourself. Ask what's going on. Do you need something? Um, that's, that's, again, that's the most important thing. If we don't hear about it, if, if we don't get the reports, if these things are going on and nobody's saying anything, there's not much we can do at that point. Unfortunately, in that case, it took near fatality for us to get involved. And I, you know, from the child advocacy perspective, I would echo the same thing that DA Abel said, um, you know, just be mindful of, of the kids that you see in your community, right? And you see them playing outside or know their parents or see something strange, um, you know, report it and call someone, tell someone. Um, and like you said, if, if you don't think that anything has happened because of that, call again. Um, and, you know, that's the only way that, you know, we can make a difference with the, the kids in our communities. And I will echo what they say. If you see something, say something. But I will also say, sadly, there are children in our dependency system who do not have an advocate. Um, our advocates are there on court days, which are very traumatizing for the children. I will be having a training class, um, hopefully in May. So if you are passionate about children and would like to advocate for them in their best interest, please give my office a call, scan our QR code, um, visit our website to um, get a better understanding of what we do so you can help children in the community. 
and being last, <laughs> again, everything that everybody has set up here, the squeaky wheel, you know, you, you've got to, you got to just keep at it. Um, as an advocate, that's what we're trained to do. You just keep pushing forward. You, you, you keep doing until you get the answers that you want. Um, and, and same way with Corey too, we're, we're both the, the nonprofits up here and volunteers are important. We both utilize volunteers at our organizations um, because we alone can't do all the work. So, you know, we as well have volunteers and, um, you know, are always recruiting. And again, follow, you know, everybody's on social media nowadays. So, you know, find out where all these resources are at, you know, follow those pages because then you see what is um, resources that are out there and what trainings, because we always do uh, multiple types of trainings throughout the year. So, you know, if you want to learn more about services, follow us on, you know, our social media pages, our websites, because, you know, as, as our organizations, we do provide a lot of resources to the community. And the more people that know about our resources, the more people we can help and everything, so. Yeah. Well, maybe it's more for, uh, three ladies on the panel, but why is April important? It's Child Abuse Prevention yeah. Month. <laughs> um, we have to, we, oh, oh, and I apologize. I'll let you get there, but I'm going to start. We all have you our do. blue one. We got our blue one. You know, um, April is so important. Child Abuse Prevention Month is us bringing awareness of something that is so seriously happening in our community. We don't want to talk about it. So in April, we want to bring that awareness to our community to say, sadly, this is something that's happening in our community. And let's be the like people who make a change. And I will let Andrea <laughs> go with the other one. I'm but, very protective. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> so along with April, with being Child Abuse Prevention Month, um, it is also Sexual Assault Awareness Month and then Victims' Rights. So um, we, our agency celebrates all three. At Corey, they celebrate all three too because we share a lot of the same kids. Um, her going through dependency court, us going through criminal court. So, you know, we do share a lot of those same same individuals. Um, but just another statistic out there, just so you know, with, with everything going on in Fayette County, we had last year um, child sexual abuse cases was 323 cases. Our physical abuse cases, we had 76 physical abuse cases of children. That's unacceptable. That, that's just, you know, we need to be better at stopping this um, as a community, as a community. Are police and CYS the only ones that can take, like, protective custody of a child if there's some type of neglect or abuse that's happening? Are they the only ones that can step in and, and come? And yes, because even from a child advocacy perspective, we cannot take protective custody of a child. We would have to notify if, you know, if there was a child that we were interviewing, obviously police and CWS are typically there to watch our interviews, but every once in a while, they might not be on site. Um, and we have to call either CYS or law enforcement to be able to get the ball rolling on that. So what I uh, didn't attend the most recent, but I did Days ago, the human trafficking task force, which was very informative, and I guess more of a comment than a question. I had always thought about human trafficking in terms of more the international cross state line kind of thing, and in that meeting, it, it kind of like was a light switch that there's a different kind of human trafficking, and it's when the caretakers are basically pimping out the kids. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that it's um, when you look at it in that perspective, that's child abuse, right? Mm -hmm. It's um, child abuse, yes. We should also be looking at those kinds of For human trafficking? In, in terms of in-home human trafficking. Because my fear is, and, and is that that's happening much more regularly here in, in our area than we care to acknowledge or admit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. And I would say, you know, some of those same signs of child sexual abuse, because human trafficking of children is child sexual abuse. Um, you know, where the kids are withdrawn, they don't have any friends, you know, you can't 
You can't invite your friends over to your house because there's probably all kinds of people over there who shouldn't be there. Um, things happening that shouldn't be happening. Um, and, you know, just looking for, you know, or some of the adolescents, preteens, are they walking around with designer, you know, handbags or always have their nails done, their hair done? You know, do they look different from time to time when you see them and and think, hmm, I don't, she, she didn't have those, you know, brand new $200 shoes on the other day or, you know, and then if you ask how that came about and they can't give you a really good answer um, for that, that you might suspect that there's some money exchanging hands and or the child's being bought all of these gifts in exchange for something else. So when that happens and the children are asked and they don't talk, does that tie everybody else's hands when it's actually happening but they're not saying that it's happening? No, not necessarily, because we have a lot of kids who won't disclose that anything's happening, even during a forensic interview. Um, but what it, you should still report that. Anybody mm -hmm. should still re report that, because what that will do is still get other organizations involved in that family's life, in that child's life. Um, because, you know, we've seen lots of human trafficking victims that are children who want nothing to do with the system, right? They don't want the help that is out there for them, but at least the system is aware and you can step in when they're ready mm -hmm. and, you know, when it might be a good time to do that. And if I may, a lot of times these children have siblings and the siblings are seeing it. Um, and typically the siblings are also forensically interviewed, so a lot of the times the siblings will say something mm -hmm. to show that the <laughs> other one is being trafficked yeah. or yeah. the other one is being abused. Um, because a lot of the times it will be a singular child in a family um, and the siblings are seeing it and don't realize what they're seeing is wrong. So they just disclose it. And then you have a whole different type of like scenario. Why does that happen? Why is it just, you know, a single child out of multiple siblings? I wish I had an answer. Yeah, in all honesty, yeah. we ask that question all yeah. the time. It's, and you get, sometimes you get the responses from people, it's just all over, it's not consistent. It's not consistent. Um, one thing, I'm on the Human Trafficking Task Force for Fayette County. Um, one of the things that we learned at a training was when you are interacting with a potential trafficked person, on an average, it's seven type, seven times of contact with them, seven types of interaction, interviewing, before they'll actually even talk. So you have to have at least seven times where you've had contact with that individual. A lot of times you never get that opportunity where we even get that many times to be able to talk with somebody. Um, we've had a couple um, potential cases here in Fayette County within this, with, within this year of inter and we've interviewed them. Um, we, there's an assessment tool that we use to interview potential um, individuals and Sometimes they want to talk. Sometimes they don't want anything to do with you. Um, they're not ready yet, or they're in fear of their person that has them kept, you know, captive. So it's it's difficult. It's difficult to get through. And even even our victims, our children victims, um, when they're going through, and Dee Dee can talk to this. When we have kids that go for the forensic interview, sometimes they won't talk at all, and then it might be a year or two later, and then they're ready to talk, mm -hmm. and then they talk. So it's a process. I think sometimes people are afraid to report it because they're afraid the kid's going to get in trouble. Can you maybe speak to that, uh, Mr. Uncle, about that's not usually the only crime going on in those locations. You know, this is, there's often many others that in some way that child might be participating in. Can you speak to? <clears throat> well, that's certainly one element of it. Yeah. Um, also that somebody's not going to believe them or that they're going to get in trouble if they report it just because they reported it. Um, so a child's not going to get in trouble for reporting child abuse. Um, certainly a different standard for children than adults when it comes to crime. Um, um, and certainly a child can be influenced by the parents if there was some underlying offense there, but that's no reason not to not to make a report. 
So I think they think, you know, if I call and report the child's going to get charged with prostitution or the child's going to get charged with selling drugs or, you know, whatever all they have them wrapped up in. Um, That's not how it works. The district attorney's office has no interest in prosecuting a victim of child abuse for, I mean, if, if you have a, if you have a 16 year old girl that's engaged in prostitution because her parents are putting her through it, she's not going to get charged. It's not how it works. Any other questions? Panelists, anything to add? Yeah. I just want to say, this is a really good session. A lot of good information for the public. Uh, we can ever help. I know some of you up there do proclamations, uh, awareness, commissioners can be to help make it better awareness of the issues. Uh, please don't hesitate to call us. Ask us to do that at our meetings, uh, ceremonies. Uh, it's important that we get the word out. Certain things that we, the public needs to know. These, these sessions are helpful too. So thanks for, for coming to take care of this. There'll be a lot more people here, a handful of people here tonight, but many more will see it on TV. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's a good thing. If we do have a problem, I agree. Any way you can tackle these problems, to have organ great organizations like we have that are up at the table there, and our district attorney is working hard to prosecute people that do this type of thing and law enforcement. But uh, you know, it's you guys do the work day in and day out. I think our our job as commissioners is to support you, do what we can to increase the awareness. Does the sex trafficking go through child lines, or does that immediately go to the police? It can go through both. Okay. There's also a card over here on our table about sex trafficking, and it does give you another um, hotline to call, depending on the situation, especially if somebody's not from here, maybe they are from another country or <coughs> further away in this country, that can help provide resources to get them back ah. to where they should be. We're still working on getting a, a concrete policy in place. Um, that's one of the things that, that I had on my agenda coming into office, um, something that we're hoping to get nailed down here in the near future. There is a bit of a different process. When we identify that, there's different people that are called. Um, we believe, I believe we've identified a liaison um, sometimes we have contacts with the FBI, other agencies to get involved, depending on what it is. Um, it's a little more involved, I think. Not that not that the typical child abuse report is not involved with a number of agencies, but there's there's a lot of different elements to sex, sex trafficking that's a lot more complicated than run of the mill child abuse case here in the county. So. Um, like I said, we're still we're working on that, but that's um, we'll have that in place shortly. We we do appreciate everyone coming out today. We appreciate all the support that we all get um, because again, it, it's it's the community. So thank you um, on behalf of the Crime Victim Center, but on behalf of everybody here up on the board. Um, you know, we do appreciate coming out um, and supporting us and look out for uh, our location next April. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.